All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Ian Ewer. I'm a member of the Portland Arcade Collectors community locally here. Um, Coin-operated games is the hobby that took over my life. I've got probably, I, I don't know, I honestly have lost count of how many machines I own. So anytime you have a large number of machines, you're going to have stuff break down. We're getting on to, you know, the golden age of arcade games was 79 to 82. So we're coming up real quick on 40 years that these machines have been used, hopefully. Any complex system like this is going to break down if you use it over that amount of time. And when you own that number of machines, you've really got to figure out how to fix them yourself. So what we're going to do here is dive into how a centipede arcade PCB works, some of the ways it fails, and some techniques you can use to troubleshoot it. I think centipede is a really good example because it was a pretty simple board, 1980, uh, so you have some aspects of 1970s PCB design, but a lot of the same techniques are used through all of the Golden Age machines. And I'm hopefully going to teach you some common things that you're going to find on any arcade PCB. So it's, it's a good skill set because it's fairly understandable, uh, but those same uh, circuit designs were used in many, many boards. Uh, yes, JAMO didn't happen until the mid-80s, so yeah, everything was unique at, the, at this time. Um, so I was working on these slides just up until a couple minutes ago. Uh, feel free to shout out any questions if you got them, um, and we'll just try and get through this. So one of the most important things that you got to have when you're working on PCBs is uh, a bench rig. So you can build yourself one of these for you know not that much money, get a JAMA harness, a couple adapters, power supply. Um, there's no reason to bother with input output at all. All you want is power, video, audio, and that's it. And maybe um, you know some test grabbers so you can uh, disable the watchdog, put it into test mode if uh, you don't have a switch on the PCB. So I really recommend that you do this. As far as the monitor goes, there are some uh, converters that'll let you use LCDs, but I've never had good luck with those. So I'd really strongly recommend that you find a CRT to use it with. Uh, Commodore CRTs are pretty pretty easily adapted to this. Sony PVM, you can plug the signal right in. I really like the PVMs because they have the built-in audio amplifier too, so you can just run all of that stuff right in there. Okay, I'm going to give you a crash course on electrical engineering as applied to arcade PCBs. So all of these use TTL, which is a way of mapping the analog voltage domain into the digital logic domain. So all of these use a plus 5 volt power supply. And the logical zero, false, or off is a voltage level from zero to 0 0.8 volts, roughly. Logical one, true, on is two volts up to your supply voltage. So those two voltages driving a line will indicate to other parts on that line whether or not it's uh, a one or a zero bit. For some of these parts, you also have tri-state logic where the internally in the chip, the input will be separated. And you're, these are used in applications where multiple parts need to drive on the same line, like on an address bus or a data bus. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over a cold here. So we're going to look at, uh, this is a, an example from a schematic, and we're just going to look through some of these parts. So you can see over here we have the uh, ground symbol. That's the uh, three lines. That indicates your power ground. There's a plus five up there for your power. The... Uh, Parts are all indicated with both the part number, generally the part number, and uh, the position. So you can see there's N1, it's a 74LS04. All of these are built out of 74XX TTL logic, so usually the 74 is just omitted and it'll say S04 or LS04, depending on the part. S04 is a little faster, but you can usually swap out either in that application. Anything with this square, like on P2, that's an LS163 counter. Anything with that square indicates that you're looking at the pinouts or the connections for an entire package. That's the whole part right there. And then below that, you see on K3, there's a uh, logic gate symbol. Or on K4, there's a logic gate symbol. So that's one gate on a part that has multiple logic gates. So you might see another K4 somewhere else on the schematic with different pin diagrams just for ease of laying out the schematic so it's readable. You might separate that physical position out. Generally, your inputs are on the left-hand side, and you read to the right, and on the right-hand side are your outputs. You can see in this case, we have some outputs on the uh, bottom of that P2 counter. 
but generally that's how it goes. Bottom or right hand are outputs, top left hand are the inputs. So using that diagram and looking at the data sheet, you should be able to figure out what actually is happening with the signals on that part. Uh, the pull-up resistors are another thing that we should cover. Um, sometimes you see that PR10, that means it's a pull-up resistor. So that's something that's connected between that pin and the plus five supply line so that that pin is held in a logic high state versus a logic low state. Uh, and then in order to drive it, you will sync that towards ground. Whether or not a line is active high or active low is indicated by the presence or absence of a line over the signal. So you can see there's a, an IRQ reset line there on pin one of D4. That has a line over the top, so that means normally that is held at a logic high state. In order to activate it, you sync it to ground. Whereas on IRQ, you can see there is no line, so it's, uh, when it's turned off, it's at logic off, and then when it's turned on, it's logic uh, true. So that's just whether it's normal or inverted. Some general techniques that are going to be handy for you are listed out here. So if you have a logic probe, that'll let you see what the state of a particular line is, whether it's being driven, ho driven high or sunk to ground. Um, a lot of times what will happen is your lines internally in the part will get shorted to either VCC or ground, and they'll just be stuck in one state or another. Just sticking a logic probe on it and knowing should this line have a signal on it or not, you'll be able to tell real quick if that's the case and if you need to replace that part or whether it's suspect. Piggybacking is another real simple technique. All you have to do is take a known good part, hopefully you have a supply of some common ones, and uh, just bend the legs in a little bit and slide it over top of your part that you suspect is bad. This doesn't always work, but this is kind of a real simple test. If you suspect that part, you put that on and what will happen is the good part will drive the lines in the correct way instead of the bad part, uh, you know, sinking it or having it stuck. And in that way, you can get a good sense. If it changes even, even if it's not working, if you get a different problem, then that's a good indication that there's something wrong with that part. So you can go and replace that. Uh, real basic technique is just to swap parts and see where the symptom goes. So, you know, these machines were designed to be repaired by apes, basically, uh, you know, you, it's uh, composed of large things. So you could say, is it a PCB problem? Well, I'll fix it by replacing the PCB. Is it a monitor problem? I'll fix it by replacing the monitor. And this is a technique that's just a finer grain. So you might, uh, you know, maybe you have a whole machine and it's not working. Put the PCB in a known test rig. Does it work there? Okay, that says that your problem is in your cabinet somewhere. So at that point, you might swap out the power supply start figuring out where the problem is actually originating. And then once you are onto the PCB, you want to uh, you want to backtrack. So once you find something that's not right, go look in your schematic for what pins are connected to that part, what are the inputs for that output that's not working, and do, do those look good or are the inputs bad? So you can start following it up the schematic and tracing up to the origin and hopefully you'll find the bad part that way. All right, here's a centipede PCB because uh, I covered that part already. Uh, so power, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, without the power, the game isn't going to run or certain parts of it might not run. So understanding what it's doing is important <coughs> to diagnosing your problem. So power comes in a couple different flavors. There is off-board regulated power. Uh, so that means that you have a power supply external to the board and then all of the power it needs is supplied by that. Um, there is also onboard power supplies. So you might have a step-down transformer in the cabinet and then you get unregulated AC and then the power is regulated on the board. So a lot of uh, black and white games, a lot of Namco early games worked this way. So you need to know, if you want to fix the board, you need to know a little bit about how the power supply works. Uh, and then other systems have some combination of the two where maybe plus five is regulated off board, but a secondary voltage is regulated on board from a secondary AC source. So plus five is the most important power source that runs all of the TTLs, that covers all the logic on the PCB. Uh, if you're missing audio, that's a, there's a good chance that your plus 12 is missing. The plus 12 usually drives your audio amplifier. And then depending on what kind of uh, parts you have on your board, you might need to have a minus five, minus 12. 
something like that. So kind of understanding what uh, power sources your board needs. You know, if you know it needs uh, minus five in order to run the, uh, the proms, then, and you're, you have a problem that looks like that, then that's what you should be looking at. So if you have bad power, uh, probably the most common is the plus five is dead, so the board just doesn't work. Real common. Uh, or it might be that it seems like it's playing, but you have an image but no sound, or sound but no image. That's a good, uh, that's a good indication that your plus five is fine, but you're missing a plus 12 or some other voltage. Uh, and then on Centipede, particularly, a lot of the early Ataris, they have uh, an obscure and obsolete um, method of saving their high scores that needs negative 28 volts. So uh, that's regulated on board. If that power supply is dead, then your high score save won't work, but everything else will be fine. Uh, troubleshooting power, check the connectors. A lot of times they'll get burnt up. You pull the edge connector off, the pads are all burnt on the PCB. Um, you know, swap out your power supplies, see where the trouble uh, follows. Meter it out, uh, really easy. You want to be shooting for around you know, 5.1 volts uh, on the PCB. You know, you're going to lose some voltage across your harness, so you don't want to measure on the power supply. You want to see what is actually being delivered to the board, because you're going to have some resistance through that system. Uh, and then the worst problem, or the hardest to detect, is AC ripple. So all these old linear power supplies use big filter capacitors in order to turn your uh, choppy DC into a nice, smooth, regulated supply. Uh, when those capacitors age, then some of that AC waveform will ride on top of your DC voltage. And that can really mess stuff up. I've seen that break a lot of systems. So ideally you have a scope, and you can, if you scope that out, you can see that AC waveform riding right on top of it. Uh, you can also set your meter to AC volts and see if you're reading AC on your DC lines. It's a good indication that that's your issue. Uh, let's pause here and see, are there any questions about any of this so far? Am I going at a good speed, or how's that? Questions? No? Yes? Um, is it okay to measure up across the fuses? I've, I've got a problem with my MizPak that for some reason my graphics are messing up on the screen, and I was told that my power supply might be bad, and it's got the original um, transformer power supply inside the I would say it's probably not your power supply. But when you're measuring a fuse, you should always lift one side of it out of circuit. On I, That specific problem has tripped me up before because it was reading continuity through the windings of the transformer instead of across the fuse, which was blown. So you should always lift at least one leg or you know lift one side if you don't pull the whole thing out when you meter. Otherwise, you could get a false reading. But for that, you have an onboard DC regulation for that. So you would be looking on the board, not on the transformer. <clears throat> OK, let's talk about clocks. Uh, clocks are square waves that happen at a specific interval, and that synchronizes access to different parts of the board, runs the CPU, runs the video. Uh, if your clocks aren't working, your whole board is not going to work. So this is a good problem to have, because these are pretty simple to figure out. Uh, you know, a lot of people see a board and then they boot it up totally dead and they think, oh, you know, it's something major. It doesn't do anything. I love those boards. Those are the easiest to fix because, you know, a major problem like that is easy to find. The problems that are hard to find are it works, but those really suck to track down. All right. So uh, here we have Y1, which is our 12 megahertz crystal. So that's going to be uh, sinking that line a little bit uh, at a 12 megahertz interval. Um, and then that goes into Q1, which brings that up to TTL levels, and then into the N1, uh, NAN, I think that's a, what is that, NOT gate? NOT gate at a N1, so that produces a nice square wave. Your crystal gives you sort of a dirty sine wave, and so you've got to boost that up so it hits your TTL levels, and then feed that into that IC, and you'll get a nice clean square wave out. Uh, a lot of people get tripped up with this because Y1 does not output a TTL signal, so you can't measure it with a logic probe. So people will say, oh, my clock's messed up. Probe that. Oh, I got nothing. I need to replace my crystal. Um, that's just a misapplication. If you want to measure that, you need to use a scope or measure it on that TTL chip in order to read it with a logic probe. Okay. 
So once you have that square wave, it feeds it into this counter. So the counter is a clock divider. Uh, this is a binary counter, so every time the clock ticks, it increments a number. So binary numbers, how many of you have knew, you know binary math? Raise your hand. Okay, enough. Uh, where are we at? So here's just a, a simple indication or a, a visualization of that. So every subsequent bit of that output, uh, it gives you a clock signal divided down one half. So if we look back at that uh, counter, there's our uh, six megahertz clock, a couple other clocks out there, and then into the CPU, uh, we feed this uh, phi zero, which is our 1.5 megahertz clock that drives the microprocessor. Yeah, definitely, you should be measuring it there, and if it's not, then you need to follow that back up into your sync chain. Uh, a scope is really good for this, especially if you have a, a newer digital scope, because you can stick it on there and it'll tell you the frequency of that waveform. So if you're you know, shorted to one of your other clocks, your CPU won't be running right. You'll be able to measure that with your scope. Uh, so reset and power on watchdog. Uh, even if the CPU has the clock, it doesn't actually start running until it's reset. So some people think reset means that you know, it's already running and then you're starting it over, but you have to do that when you first boot up in order for it to start running. And there's a circuit that does that. So, so just it, when it's first powered up, it'll delay a little bit, trigger that reset, start your CPU running. Uh, there's also a watchdog so operators found that these games, you know, if, if they didn't have a watchdog, they would just freeze up when they were on location, and then you'd have to go out and reset them. You know, just power cycle it, comes back up. Because you can't fix every bug, and you can't rely on it working reliably all of the time. So they built the watchdog. And this is hooked into the CPU's address bus. So when the program, when the game program is running normally, it frequently is resetting the watchdog. The watchdog is just a counter, and if uh, it hits zero, then it triggers the reset line, and the game resets. So if it's not running right, then it just resets. It's the same thing as your operator going out there and power cycling it, but it's built into the game. Uh, the downside is that this can really mess you up if you're trying to figure out a problem, because it can just be resetting over and over again because it's not running right to begin with. Uh, but that's this. I like this circuit design because it feeds right into that same, uh, that same part that handles the power on reset. I think it's a pretty cool design because it does that. All right, uh, that slide shouldn't be there. <laughs> so clock and reset problems. So like I was saying, you might power it up and just have a dead board. Um, that's great. Uh, static rug when it's powered on. So understanding how the game boots up is helpful here. Pretty much right at the beginning of the game's power on, when it resets, it goes through an initialization sequence, which includes zeroing out all of your video memory. One of the first things that the program does, because when you power it on, just whatever garbage is in your RAM ends up getting displayed on your screen as video. So one of the first things it does, it just zeroes that out so you get a blank screen. You power it up and you just get garbage all over the screen and nothing moves, great indication that the program is not running at all. So that can be a reset issue, that can be a ROM issue, um, but I would say most often it's a power on reset circuit problem. Um, depending on the board, they can handle that, that, yeah, that can work in different ways. Uh, oftentimes there's a 555 or 556 counter on there, and it just counts down and resets that way. So look for that. Really easy way you can see if that's the case, if your board has a reset button, just press it. If it runs normally, you know your power on reset's dead. Uh, and then the other issue that can happen is there's no sync or it's resetting watchdogging. So those are all issues that can indicate clock problems. Probably the most common problem I've seen is just that the crystal has been ripped off the board. Um, these old games have super tall crystals that stick up off the board and a lot of times depending on how the board has been stored. You know, if it's in a cabinet, hopefully it's okay, but if you're just pulling them off a pile you got out of a warehouse, they've probably been stacked up. A lot of times the crystal's just ripped right off or a lead is broken internally. So just wiggle that around and see 
is that the problem? Um, they make these really nice low profile crystals now. <clears throat> so I like to replace any crystal I come across that has that issue with one of those low profile ones so it doesn't happen again. Um, definitely put a scope on the crystal and see is that the problem? That's your right there. As long as you have power in a crystal, you should be seeing something there. Um, so that can be the issue. I've definitely found failed crystals, but I'd say more often it's a physical issue. And then your clock dividers. So if you have a scope and you have two channels, you just kind of walk from one to the other back and forth. And you, you'll be able to see both clock signals and it should look just like that diagram where each successive one is half the interval of the other one. If you see two different signals that are the same uh, frequency, then you know your clock divider is broken, so you want to replace that. And yeah, if you see that static rub, it, it's almost always a power on reset issue. Questions? Yep. You mentioned uh, logic probe earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you find logic analyzers to be of any use, or is that a little bit too beefy? I mean, like the, the prices have come down on them now, so you can get them for like a hundred bucks out of China. Yeah, they can definitely be useful. I would say if you haven't done a lot of repair work, they're probably more tool than you need. Uh, Logic Probe you can get for about 18 bucks off Amazon. Uh, the L what is it? Elenco LP560, I think, is the one. Um, really good Logic Probe. Logic Analyzer is really more useful if you need to um, have a more methodical approach or you once you get to the point where you kind of know what the deal is and you want to speed up the process, they can be very useful. But they also require a fair amount of setup. So you have to, uh, you know, you'd want to probe clip. So you're going to be clipping multiple chips and then you set it up so that it's, uh, you know, you have to set up when it clocks data in. It, it definitely requires more legwork in order to get a useful result. Whereas a logic probe, you just touch it to the part and it tells you if it's working. So. Logic Probe is good if you need to analyze multiple signals and their relationship to each other. So if you wanted to debug a clock divider issue, you might stick a, a logic analyzer on that and set it to your 12 megahertz clock and then read all the other ones in as data. And you should get that exact chart where you see the frequencies. So that'll tell you, you know, in one go, is my clock chain working or not? Um, versus having to go probe each individual pin. So that's a case where it would be useful. but it's such a simple circuit that, you know, you may as well just use the logic probe. Um, what is it? The, uh, I, don't, I can never pronounce it. Sale, S-A-L-A-E. -E. Yeah, they, they make a nice one that works on your PC now. And yeah, I think you were saying it's a hundred bucks or so. Yeah. Um, it looks pr pretty good, but I'm kind of like, I like the dedicated hardware myself. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about CPU cycles and bus operations. Uh, I know this is very exciting. So as the CPU is executing, it's telling other components on the board what it's doing. And this is used to synchronize up different parts of the board so that they all work together at the right time. So it's got address outputs. So addresses are outputs only, uh, and then it's got data data lines which are input and output and it has a read and write line. So every cycle you're going to start off reading an instruction from memory and then pulling that data in and executing it and then doing whatever else it needs to do. So that read write indica line indicates whether or not it's sending data out or reading data in. So here's a, this is a screen grab right out of the 6502 data sheet. Um, so the sync line lets everything know that it's time for the CPU to do some uh, work on the address bus. Uh, and then at the same time, you'll see it drives the read and write line high to, uh, oh geez, what slide is this? Okay, it's reading data. Reads, drives it high so it knows that it's gonna read and that the address outputs are on the address lines. And then when the uh, data is ready for the CPU to read, uh, the other device pulls ready low, and then the CPU reads that data into its register or memory wherever the code tells it to. Um, writing is a little bit simpler because you don't have to wait for that data to come out. So you just uh, signal on the read-write line, the address line, and the data, and it 
does whatever it needs to do. Um, so we think a lot about memory being RAM or ROM, but for all these, any 6502-based machine, uh, everything is mapped into memory, all of your inputs and outputs, everything that the CPU controls, your, you know, your video output, uh, well, not directly video output, but your video RAM, um, your controls, your sound, the dip switches, all of that stuff is mapped into memory and just read in like it is uh, anything else. And the CPU doesn't really know, it's just the responsibility of the programmer to write the code that reads in the right thing or writes the correct thing to the correct location in that address space. So how does it know which thing it's talking to or how, how do those devices know they're being, uh, that they're receiving data or that they need to send data? So for that, we have an address decoder. And this splits up the memory map of the CPU so that the data, the signals go to the correct devices. So let's take a look at the memory map here. You see that addresses zero through three FF are RAM. How does the CPU know that? How does the board know that that address is RAM? So if you look at the schematic for the RAM, you see there's two, two one one fours and they have these three control signals, write, RAM, and uh, RAM zero. So those lines are connected to the, the chip select input of those RAMs. So as I was saying before with the high Z state, when the chip select line is, uh, when it's high, then the chip is not selected, none of the data presented on the address inputs is gonna actually go into the chip. You have to pull that line down in order to activate those. And this is because we are gonna have multiple devices talking on the address bus. We need to send those addresses to these RAMs, to the ROMs, to the um, latches for the inputs, whatever else. So let's take a look up the uh, chain at that. So here's the address decoder schematic. So you see there's our RAM zero signal being output and if you look Back on the uh, left-hand side, you see there's A, B, 10, 11, and 12. So uh, I thought I had covered buffers already, but I guess those are next. So those are uh, buffered address lines, and I think I have slides for those in a little bit. So when, when those addresses are based on the status of those three bits of the address space, that'll trigger that RAM zero line that'll select those chips. Uh, so what's that LS42? So you can see it's a multi-purpose decoder so it takes four different inputs and provides 10 different outputs. So that sounds like exactly what we need to turn uh, a parallel binary number into you know, one or more uh, chip select outputs. So let's take a look at the truth table. So we can see for all of these inputs, um, they're all, so if we look back at this, the RAM zero output is on pin zero of that decoder. So on the truth table, pin zero, in order to toggle that, all of the inputs have to be in the low input state. So how does that look on the address map? So those are high and low bounds. And we can see how that lines up with the, uh, the RAMs there. So there we have addresses uh, 10, 11, and 12. And those are those bits. And you see uh, if you just mask off those bits, you end up with 0, 2, 3, FF. So just based on those bits of the uh, of the address that the CPU puts out, that'll fire one line that enables the chip. So what about A14 and A15? You see those are all the way up, the, up there at the left. We have a 16-bit address bus, but those two lines aren't part of the input. So what's the deal with that? Well, the address decoder only handles addresses, uh, address lines A13 and lower. So if you toggle those bits in those two addresses, it doesn't know that they even exist so what you have is a sloppy address decoding because not every one of those address lines is used to, uh, to select the chip, then you have that same area of memory shadowed. So if you look at 4000 through 43FF, 8000 8, to 83FF, that RAM is gonna be addressable in those ranges just the same as in you know, the, the real quote unquote range just because those bits aren't factored into your address decoder. So some tools, uh, some automated systems will try to like probe around on your board and figure out where does stuff live on it. 
and these are always going to screw up in this case because it can't figure it out because of that shadowing. So it's important to actually read and understand the schematic, in my opinion, and uh, apply some knowledge and intelligence to it rather than just you know, trusting it to get it right. And then if you go back and you look at the, uh, the CPU schematic, those address lines just aren't even connected anywhere. You know, we didn't need those at all. So decoder symptoms. So again, the board can watchdog or not boot. Uh, if you have a self-test mode, you might have RAM or ROM tests fail uh, or some stuff doesn't work. Um, so I, it's kind of broad based, but you know, if it's not working, your clocks are okay, everything else looks good, you should be looking at that. And then how should I troubleshoot this? So this can be a hard problem to solve. Uh, so if you have a, a tool that lets you do an in-circuit emulation, you can read on those addresses and then look at your chip select outputs and see if they're toggling. Um, you know, if your output's dead, then the chip doesn't toggle and your stuff don't work. Um, it can also be that your write enable line isn't happening. So in order to, for uh, a RAM to accept a write, it has to have the chip selected and it has to be in write mode instead of read mode. So that's another feature of the address decoder that line might not be working. All of your address and data stuff could be fine, but the fact that it's not saying, I need to write this data means that you don't read the correct data back, so your RAM test fails. Um, you can have issues where multiple chip select lines are triggered at the same time for the same address. So in that case, you have multiple things trying to drive the bus, and uh, then your data is corrupt when it gets to the CPU. Uh, so definitely check all that stuff out. Understand the memory map. You need to know how stuff is actually fit in, how it fits together, how it's supposed to work. Okay, this should have been before, but we're gonna cover it. So how do buses actually work? Um, because all of these different devices are mapped into the same space, they talk over the same lines. So you have your address lines going to all of your RAMs, all of your ROMs, data lines coming back from those into the CPU. Uh, those lines tend to be fairly long, have a lot of resistance to them, and maybe you don't want all of those signals to go to every part all the time. So to solve that problem, you have uh, buffer driver parts. So on your address lines, you've got these LS244s. These are super common. Pretty much every board uses these. Uh, these are one-way buffer drivers because your address lines on your CPU, those are output only. Nothing ever sends address data to the CPU. CPU sends the addresses to the rest of the board and then they send the response via the data lines. So these are just one way and these will drive enough current to, uh, to bring those lines up to logic high or sync enough to bring them down to logic low uh, for every device on the bus. And your CPU doesn't have to do that. These parts can. Also, if you have something that's you know, chewing up your bus or you know, too much voltage on it, then these are gonna protect your CPU because these are going to blow out rather than killing your CPU, and these cost 10 cents instead of who knows how much. Uh, they're also still making these, so I don't know if they're still making 6502s, but these are definitely a lot easier to replace. So if you see on the left-hand side, uh, you can't see it, but that's the, the main CPU. Those are the address lines, and those are just numbered A0 through A7. That's half the address bus. And then on the other side of the buffer, it's AB. So this is a real common convention in schematics. Uh, the address lines initially are just A0 through A7 or A15 in this case. And then when it's buffered, it's AB, or if it's the buffered data bus, it's DB. So because this has a 16-bit data bus, there are another one of these buffer drivers for the, the high bits of the address. This is just half because it fits on the slide better. So data buses have a little bit more going on. Instead of the 244, these have a 245, which is a bi-directional buffer latch. So you see down there at the bottom, there's uh, pin one is dir, that's the direction, that's whether it's uh, driving those lines out or if it's reading the data in in order to send the CPU's data inputs. And that's based on the uh, BRW line. So RW line again is indicating whether the CPU is doing a read or a write operation. B is the buffered version, so there's a, another output from another driver that buffers that. Um, so G is the enable output pin, so when that's driven high, that isolates the part. So you can see there's uh, 
some stuff here that will isolate that when other parts need to talk on that bus. It'll isolate the CPU. And we're going to skip that because I'm covering it again. RAM. Uh, RAM is one of the most common failures on any classic arcade board. Uh, all these golden age games use static RAM. Static RAM just means that you write the value to it and then you can read it back at any time and it has the same thing. Uh, versus more modern dynamic RAM, which you have to have a controller for and needs refresh cycles and all this other stuff. So uh, static RAM is a lot simpler to use. All the old arcade boards used it. Uh, no one really makes it anymore. It's kind of a pain in the ass to track down. Kind of expensive. Uh, fails all the time. Bane of the existence of anyone who works on these games. So how does it work? So putting all these parts together, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So 2114s are 1024 by 4. I don't know if you've ever looked at a RAM data sheet, but you often see them expressed like this. 1024 means it has 1024 cells. 4 means it has 4 bits per cell. So for an 8-bit system like this, you have to put two of these together, and you see that right here on this slide. One of these has the data lines 0 through 3. The other has 4 through 7, so together they store an 8-bit value. So from the CPU's perspective, anything it writes to an address is going to be split across these two parts. So it can be kind of a pain to figure out which of the two is broken. Um, you need to be looking at it and see on which side of the divide am I seeing corrupt data, and that can help you track down which part it is if you look at the schematic and see which one does what. Uh, and you can see down there at the bottom the uh, RAM zero lines, the chip select lines for that address they're both enabled. So address lines go into both, but the data bus is split between the two. Uh, some other games, some older games use different RAMs. Uh, a lot of the 70s games use one-bit RAMs. Uh, Space Invaders, all those midway L-shaped boards, boards, these suck. Uh, you, have, you have a bank of eight. Each one of those has one data line that it handles instead of four. Newer ones use 8-bit, which is a lot easier, or 16-bit. Uh, but 2114s are super common on all of the Golden Age games. There's also multiple banks of RAM. So this is the CPU's scratch RAM, where it stores its stack, all of its program state, all that stuff. There's also a separate memory area for the video. Um, you know, new stuff is going to have a frame buffer, so it's enough RAM that it can store every pixel that appears on the screen, probably multiple pages of it, so you can double buffer and draw to one and then flip. Old games didn't do that. Everything was uh, generated on the fly. So this whole video system is just there to turn uh, a more abstract representation of what should be appearing on the screen into the actual video. So in this case, you can see these are, uh, well, maybe you can't see, it's too small. Uh, but these have seven different address lines, I'm sorry, eight different address lines, zero through seven. So uh, that's a 256 by four uh, RAM there. And uh, those are faster. So you almost always want faster RAM for your video because you have uh, the CPU and the video hardware accessing it at the same time. Uh, RAM symptoms, again, board watchdogs doesn't boot resets. Corrupt graphics, if it has a self-test mode, you might get self-test beeps and get some errors in there. Uh, it can cause all kinds of problems because it'll keep the program from running the way it's supposed to. Uh, if your board has a self-test, definitely make use of that, but also understand what the limitations are. Depending on the board, it might not test all of your RAM. Uh, any of the Atari vectors are a good example of this. Asteroids, Tempest, Battlezone, Asteroids Deluxe, They'll test the scratch RAM, but they won't test the vector RAM at all. So you can have an issue there, and it just won't even won't tell you. So you have to have some other approach to test that. Um, you can kind of logic probe through that and see, are any of my outputs stuck? Uh, that's a pretty easy test. You can piggyback that as well. If you have an in-circuit analyzer, you can do a test in-circuit. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and the RAM is socketed, and you can just pull that out and stick it in an external tester. Um, Anytime I'm trying to test something, I want to try to test it both in the circuit and out. So you can say, again, you know, where is the problem following? Is it in the part? If I pull the part, does that part still fail? If it's in the board, it's something on the board. If it is a RAM issue and you swap the chip just randomly, technically you should see something change. 
Yeah, you, could, you can definitely do that. Uh, if you, so if you have a self-test mode and it has self-test beeps, you might swap it into a different bank and then see does the number of beeps change. That would be a good test to see is that RAM failing. Uh, or if you suspect it's a video RAM, you might swap it with one of the scratch pad RAMs and test it that way. Uh, but really, hopefully you have an external RAM tester or something that can test a little more thoroughly. The built-in RAM tests are pretty good, but there are certain failures that they won't catch. So in order to be really comprehensive, you actually have to pull it and test it. Uh, but I really, I hate pulling stuff unless I'm really sure that's the problem. Uh, you know, I don't like putting too much heat on the boards. I don't like stressing them that way. Any other questions on this section? Okay, we are running out of time, so I'm not gonna cover everything. I'm gonna kinda blow through some of this stuff and then have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, ROMs, pretty straightforward once you understand how the RAM stuff works, except for there's a lot more address space taken up by ROMs because they were cheaper and you don't ever write data to them so you don't have to deal with uh, that aspect at all. Um, you know, you just apply data to the uh, address lines, or I'm sorry, you apply the address to the address lines, you get data out on the data output lines. Each one of these outputs eight bits of data so it's not split. Some early games have PROMs where they do have, you know, one, two, four bits, something like that, and you have to bank them together. But most of the golden age was uh, using these eight bit ROMs. Uh, and then you see down at the bottom there, the, there are those chip select lines, so based on where it's looking in the address space, it'll pick the right ROM. Uh, ROMs are almost always socketed, so uh, those are real handy, real easy to test. ROM symptoms, again, board watchdogs doesn't boot, resets. Uh, you can have graphics that are missing or corrupt, uh, self-test errors. Uh, you'll get self-test errors as long as the ROM with the self-test code isn't the one that's failed, so <laughs> you know, be aware of that. Uh, and then one of the problems that so many Atari boards have is the coin counter clicks. I hear this and I know, ah, I know exactly what's wrong with your machine. Uh, and it's almost always the ROMs or the sockets. The ROM sockets are another huge failure, especially on these Atari boards. You know, you pull the ROM out and they just crumble to pieces. Uh, so those are a good thing to replace as well. But what'll happen is because the CPU starts executing garbage data instead of the actual ROM, it'll just end up spraying writes all over the place and the coin counter is mapped into your address space, so it'll start ticking over. Yeah. We have five minutes. So troubleshooting, self-test, logic probe. Uh, because you can pull these and because EEPROM programmers are real cheap, you can just pull that, verify it in the programmer. Again, that'll tell you is the problem on the ROM, is the problem on the board. So really great. Uh, okay, I have more stuff, but we are running out of time, so I think I'm just gonna Open it up for questions if anyone has anything they would like to ask up front. I have several games having sound issues. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Southern California, so my games are in the garage and it gets up to over 110 degrees. Yeah, don't do that. So I go in the garage during the summer and then when it's just going off, I flip things on. Um, I have a turkey shoot, uh, Hubert, Miss Pac Man, Pepper 2. I'll take them. <laughs> On all of them. Is that pure coincidence? Jesus, sure doesn't seem like it, does it? Uh, I mean, have you brought them in the house? Do they do them in the house? Uh, I haven't tried that, but... I would take one into your house and see if it has the same problem. That'll tell you if it's heat or not. I mean, it, it seems weird... It's cool now. I mean, it's... Yeah. That's weird. Uh, I would check your power supply first and see if you've got your plus 12 on it. Um, and yeah, definitely try just try pulling one inside and see if it has the same issue or not. I mean, it seems weird that heat would cause the exact same problem on such different machines. So yeah, try see what changes. Take it inside and see where the symptom goes. Yeah? Yep. Um, so at some point, there's a decent chance you're gonna have to pull out a soldering iron. Yeah. Any recommendations for people who are relatively new to soldering iron to avoid getting a bird? <laughs> uh, I mean, well, so the great thing about that is that, like, the human body heals, but you know, you don't. What you don't want to burn is the board, <laughs> and then you got to fix it. <laughs> um, so if you get the what is it, the Hacko nine whatever nine. 
Yeah, nine, so I have the 936, which is discontinued, but they have a new one. It's like 100 bucks. Uh, super good iron, and just set it on a fairly low setting and use uh, a good amount of flux. And uh, I also would recommend they have the screwdriver tip uh, instead of the round tip. Screwdriver tip works wonders. So I would set mine to like 350C usually, and with some flux and pre tinning it, then uh, you can keep the amount of heat on the board fairly low. And as far as not burning yourself, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Hacko, H-A-K-K-O. Okay. I'll give you my Amazon referral link after if you want. <laughs> uh, but they're, yeah, they're really good. Uh, you can get, you know, the, the high-end soldering stuff is ridiculous. You know, you can spend thousands on a station. But Hacko is like, it's the best value that you can get. Anything you spend over that is really diminishing returns. Uh, and it, what you really have to invest in is desoldering. Um, so desoldering techniques... I would say if you can have if you have the money, go get the continuous vacuum desoldering pump, the FX whatever it is. Uh, but they have that. That's really good, uh, and you can just you know half the time you desolder and the chip just falls out the other side because it's got everything out. Really strongly recommend that. If you can't go that route, the safest thing you can do, and and it sucks to do this, especially if you're working on a board with rare chips or. I mean, it sucks anyways, but especially if you think it's a part that's expensive or hard to find. But take some angle cutters and just clip the legs on the top side and pull the part off. And then grab it with the nippers gently and heat it from the bottom and then pull it out. And then from there, you can just heat it up and uh, blow into it or use a, a solder pole to clear it out. Um, I've not had good success using a solder pole to clear out uh, those legs for ICs at all. They just always end up in there and you end up heat cycling it over and over again, trying to get it out and burning the pads. And it's a real pain in the ass. So I really recommend just cut those legs, pull them out one at a time, and then clear the holes and then put a socket in there. And anytime you replace a chip, you want to put a socket in. Okay, we're at time. But thank you so much for coming out. And uh, I'll be around if you have other questions.